Actually, maybe we've leveled off now. Do you want to start, yeah. Shauna? Uh, it's two minutes past, so we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to the Target 2035 webinar on covalent ligand discovery for chemical probes challenge and targets. Um, the webinar will be recorded and uh, throughout, if you'd like to ask a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So you can just click on it, type in your question, and one of the panelists will answer it either during the session or in the chat box itself. So with that, I'll hand over to the host, Alex Bullock. Thanks, Shauna. I realised that a number of you joining today will be joining for the first time, but others of you may have catched, caught um, some of the previous webinars. So I'll just give a brief word as to what Target 35 is and its aims, and then introduce speakers. Um, so Target 2035 is a, a global mission or, or goal. Um, shared by a number of uh, chemical biologists to target uh, the genome as a whole in terms of having biological or chemical probes as tools to really discover uh, target specific function and biology, as well as target specific role in disease mechanisms. Um, so having tool compounds that are very specific, potent and cell active or biologics to really investigate and interrogate the function of a protein. Um, so this is quite different to drug development per se, where you're just looking for the maximum therapeutic uh, index. Um, so here we're really looking at target specific information. And um, for the previous meetings, we had, I think six speakers, three main talks and three short talks. Um, I think based on feedback from the previous meetings, We've shortened it today to just uh, three main talks, and then we'll have a short five minute Q&A after each speaker. Um, please use the Q&A uh, buttons in the, in the webinar to ask a question. And then um, after the talks, we'll also have a short panel discussion for any leftover items or uh, things that we want to delve into a bit more deeply. So. I'm delighted to welcome today three speakers. We have Kerry Ann Akas from UCLA, we have Neil London from the Weizmann, and we also have Nick Matessier from Molecular Forecaster and from McGill University. Um, so we're really uh, excited to kick off with the first talk from Kerry Ann, which is uh, expanding the activity based chemoproteomic toolbox. Kerry Ann. If you could share your All screen. All right. Um, well, let me get this going. First and foremost, thank you to the Target 35 organizers for this um, opportunity to present some of our research to you today. Um, it's really an exciting effort and one that I say is near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'll be talking about a sort of broadly activity-based chemoproteomic tools and things that we're doing as a lab to help make chemoproteomics faster, more in depth, and answer some sort of key unanswered questions about covalent inhibitors. Um, so, let's see if we can get going. Um, so I think, you know, I like to always start my talks with the big problem that I'd say this audience is probably um, very, very familiar with and needs no introduction, and that's the drug ability gap. So if you think about, um, the human proteome, uh, there's about 20,000 odd protein coding genes and only about 600 have been drugged. Um, and so one key feature that we um, like to take advantage of is uh, nucleophilic cysteine thiol side chains, um, which as we all know, can be targeted by small molecules. And we think that this is a really nice opportunity to start to close this drugability gap because upwards of 98% of proteins contain one or more cysteine, and really a substantial fraction of these cysteines are actually found in their reduced state. And so this is something that, you know, goes against what we learn as in introductory biochemistry. There's actually lots of um, reduced cysteines uh, sitting, waiting on protein surfaces, waiting to be drugged. 
And um, you know, a number of uh, drugs have taken advantage of this mechanism, including the covalent kinase inhibitors, as well as more recently um, uh, molecules that target the G12C mutated form of KRAS and molecules that target um, the nuclear export factor XPO1, such as uh, selexanor. And uh, you know, there's, I'd say, historically been a lot of concern about the potential for off-target reactivity and unwanted um, side effects for cysteine reactive drugs. Um, but I'd say these molecules have really shown us that covalent compounds can be safe and can be efficacious and you know, really have become blockbuster um, treatments, at least for cancers. And so that led me now, I guess, um, upwards of seven or eight years ago as a postdoc to start thinking about, you know, if uh, these uh, electrophilic compounds work for a handful of proteins, um, how many other proteins are out there in the human proteome that can be targeted via a covalent um, mechanism? And uh, this is really the question I set out to answer. And we did uh, some sort of substantial chemoproteomic profiling of uh, human proteomes and came up with a really, a, I would say, an impressive number of cysteines um, that we could target with uh, cysteine reactive compounds. And here I'm showing actually proteins rather than cysteines. And I think the home run feature of this study was that um, the overlap between the proteins targeted by cysteine reactive compounds and proteins targeted by FDA approved small molecule drugs was essentially negligible. So here this, uh, you know, 27 shared protein members across these two sets. And what this means is the uh, covalent compounds are really accessing new druggable space that hasn't been, um, I would say, sufficiently explored by established chemotypes. Um, and so for us, this means that to start thinking about closing the druggability gap, uh, cysteine reactive compounds look really promising. So when I started my an independent group at UCLA now just about three years ago, there were really two central questions that I wanted to answer coming out of this large uh, chemoproteomic study. And the first is how many cysteines are actually druggable? And so I showed you, you know, we have 700 or so cysteines on 600 or so proteins that we could drug. And I wanted to know, is this the ceiling or are there other cysteines out there, I would say lurking in the proteome that haven't yet been identified? And then the second question, and this is a much more difficult question is, what happens when you label these cysteines? So if you modify a cysteine, obviously that could impact protein function, but I can give you lots of examples of proteins where there seems to be no real detrimental effect of that labeling. And you know, we, it would be nice to be able to answer this question in a high throughput manner so that we don't have to go through and biochemically characterize each cysteine. Um, you know, there are some beautiful examples, for example, from NIR showing that we can make covalent protax, which might circumvent this, pro this problem entirely. But for us, sort of thinking about the biochemistry is quite intriguing. And so for the purpose of this talk today, we're going to focus mainly on this first question. And I'll just give you a, a teaser at the end of, of sort of where we're headed with the second question. So um, when I started my lab, um, one of my PhD students asked me, you know, really a basic, basic, basic question. And she said, okay, how many cysteines are we, you know, profiling? And how many cysteines are there actually in all human, prote uh, human proteins? And I didn't know the answer to this question, um, and I'll just you know steal her thunder here and say she went off and counted all the cysteines, you know, wrote some software, and um, turns out there's 260,000 total cysteines. Of these, we had identified about 7,000 by chemoproteomics, and we uh, annotated about 700 of these cysteines as what we call ligandable or potentially druggable. Um, and so you can see we're really only assaying a very small fraction of all cysteines. And this is intriguing because it suggests that potentially there are some limitations to our chemoproteomic methods that we could um, uh, potentially improve upon. And, and so that's really what I'm going to focus most of this talk on today is how do we go from 2.5% of the human cystinome to a fraction that's hopefully closer to 100% and how close can we get. Um, and so for this, we need to uh, think about standard chemoproteomic workflows. Um, and the most uh, chemoproteomics experiments are, are carried out in the following way. You take cells or lysates, treat them with a compound, chase with a cysteine reactive probe, such as iodocinamine alkyne, uh, and then assay 
um, small molecule labeling in a competitive manner, either by gel-based, activity-based protein profiling, or by a mass spectrometry. And um, you know, these workflows have been established now in a number of groups, and they're pretty robust. But I can tell you firsthand, having done a number of these experiments, that uh, chemoproteomics isn't perfect. And there's really some central problems with uh, sample preparation, including uh, incomplete labeling, biotacetamidalkine, um, poor or incomplete biotinylation, and poor recovery of uh, labeled peptides. And uh, so those are really the challenges that we set out to answer and, or address. And um, to get us there, uh, I'm going to take a little detour and I'm just going to close the blinds briefly because it's just morning here in LA and it's getting beautiful and sunny. Um, the uh, detour I'm going to share with you is our efforts to uh, develop alternative bioorthogonal handles, in this case, aryl iodides for chemoproteomics. And this may seem like a detour, but I, I promise it will get us back to these sort of central questions of how to improve chemoproteomics. So um, Jian Cao was a postdoc in my group at the time, and he wanted to um, not only make chemoproteomics better, but also swap out uh, the enrichment handle from our standard alkyne moiety to an aryl iodide. And he envisioned that we could uh, use aryl iodides both for gel-based activity-based protein profiling as well as chemoproteomics, um, just like it's done with standard alkyne or azide moieties. Um, and so this, this work was just recently published in Analytical Chemistry. So if you want all the details of the method optimization, I'd, I'd refer you to this paper. I'll just give you the highlights. Um, so uh, the big question you might be asking yourself is why do we need more bioorthogonal handles? Um, so, you know, alkynes and azides are great. Um, there are some limitations to them um, and including, you know, even these small modifications can be not tolerated by some um, chemical probe moieties, potentially synthetically tractable, intractable. Um, and so aryl halogens are attractive in this regard because um, they're pretty ubiquitous in drugs and drug-like molecules. Uh, they're very easy to obtain from commercial vendors um, and they're quite small. Um, and so these are features to us that made um, particularly aryl iodides very, um, tantalizing from a bioorthogonal handle perspective. Um, and another feature that made them tantalizing was uh, some prior studies actually by colleagues of mine when I was a PhD student at Oxford um, that showed that suzuki miyara cross-coupling could be carried out on recombinant proteins as well as on cell surface, um, as well as some other studies showing that uh, cross-coupling chemistry is compatible with oligonucleotides. And so, we thought we could potentially leverage some of this very innovative work and apply um, cross complex chemistry not only to recombinant proteins, but to whole cell lysates. Um, so the big challenge we wanted to see is whether or not cross coupling chemistry would proceed in complex mixtures that contain lots of nucleophilic amino acid side chains um, with high specificity. And uh, to get us there, Jian did a number of experiments and um, we'll just uh, highlight the ones that were, you know, the home run most successful experiments. Um, we conducted um, activity-based protein profiling by gel here shown as a streptavidin blot and uh, showed that basically cross-coupling chemistry could perform almost comparably to click chemistry um, in complex lysates with very little background labeling in the absence of catalysts. And so this is using um, SSFOS as um, ligand and just a standard palladium acetate um, and using standard conditions, 37 degrees. Um, so pretty um, mild uh, biocompatible conditions. And uh, to this, us, this was really exciting. We actually got this result quite quickly. And um, we then turned to chemoproteomics and we thought, okay, we'll just um, be able to verify that this works on proteins, publish the paper and be done. Um, and it turns out like most things, um, uh, the uh, experiments were slightly more complicated. And here, sorry, this is flipped. So click chemistry uh, shown down here at the bottom um, gave us really robust coverage of peptides, whereas cross coupling chemistry here uh, gave us essentially no labeling. And we reproduced this experiment over and over and over again. And we could not for the life of us get uh, uh, cross-coupled products identified on the mass spectrometer. 
And this was quite perplexing. Um, and so we went back to the drawing board and wanted to just see, okay, is our chemistry actually giving us our biphenyl, biotinylated cross, pro cross coupled product? Um, so we took recombinant protein, um, in this case, bovine serum albumin, subjected it to either click chemistry or the Suzuki conditions and uh, measured the uh, percentage of total peptides that were biotinylated, as well as labeled with just the first probe, as well as uh, the dehalogenated product in the case of Suzuki. And what we see is actually the cross-coupling chemistry is modestly outperforming the click chemistry in terms of the total peptides that are actually getting biotinylated. And so this supports that the chemistry is working, the protein is getting biotinylated. And so we hypothesized that the problem would uh, potentially stem from uh, not the chemistry, but a sort of sample cleanup problem that we're having trouble getting rid of biotin. And I think this is actually a really uh, sort of pervasive problem in chemoproteomics that trace biotin can compete for enrichment on streptavidin and neutravidin resins and decrease coverage. And we spent some time exploring different cleanup methods and uh, found that this um, SP3 resin uh, seemed to be quite promising uh, in terms of removing lots of contaminants. Um, and so we thought, okay, let's try this out and see if our chemoproteomics experiments could be improved with SP3 cleanup. And quite gratifyingly, when you uh, subject samples to SP3 cleanup, not only does the Suzuki chemistry suddenly work magically, um, a click chemistry actually also increases in, in coverage in terms of both labeled peptides as well as labeled proteins. And this is very reproducible. And another advantage of the SP3 cleanup is it decreases the amount of sample uh, required for uh, sample preparation. Um, so not only do you get more peptides, you have to use only about 20% as much sample. And so this is um, really a nice uh, method for uh, processing chemoproteomics samples. And so when we uh, had that method finally optimized, we turned to applying it to our original application of both gel and uh, chemoproteomic applications. And we conducted gel-based activity-based protein profiling on one of our favorite proteins, um, caspase 8. And we showed that we could identify labeled protein, identify labeled peptides via chemoproteomics for target deconvolution studies. Um, we can actually multiplex this chemistry, uh, combining click chemistry and cross-coupling chemistry in the same tube and identify both cysteine and lysine labeled residues in one chemoproteomic sample, which we think could be advantageous, again, for samples where um, the material is limiting. Uh, we can then apply this, um, as I said, for cysteine and lysine profiling, identify numbers of residues in single experiments. Uh, we can use this chemistry to profile bifunctional uh, chemical probes containing uh, both um, electrophilic uh, cysteine reactive moieties as well as these uh, sulfonyl fluorides that react with tyrosines and lysines. And we can identify putative sites of chemical cross-linking, um, which for those of you interested in chemical glues is an intriguing application of our uh, dual labeling chemoproteomic platform. And so all of this uh, supports um, that not only is the Suzuki chemistry quite promising, but this SP3 method really is enabling for chemoproteomics. Um, and this gets us back to our original problem of a cysteine coverage. And uh, for this, a graduate student in my lab, Sunny Yan, uh, really took the reins and ran with this challenge um, during uh, the, all of our lockdowns. Um, she took advantage of um, our access to our mass spectrometer and asked whether or not we could develop a method that would be better capable of assaying a deeper fraction of cysteines and addressing some of these challenges. Um, so the first challenge she addressed was this incomplete biotinylation. Um, so she optimized our uh, peptide biotinylation conditions to get us up to close to 100% labeling. Um, she then, with our new um, Orbitrap Triwood Eclipse mass spectrometer um, that's equipped with a FAMES um, ion mobility device, um, optimized the uh, 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 application of different compensation voltages to uh, increase coverage of labeled peptides up to um, upwards of 30,000 PSMs in a single 70-minute experiment. Um, and 
with uh, all of these innovations, um, we then have managed to get from the original number I showed you 2.5% in 2016 um, to 13% of all cysteines identified. Um, and here we compared ourselves to a recently published paper uh, by uh, Steve Gigi's lab um, using another innovative chemoproteomic method to assay cysteine ligandability, and they've assayed about 10% of the cysteinome. We also um, then asked the question, okay, if we're at 13%, how many cysteines should be dete detectable um, in an in silico triptych digest based on peptide length? And that's actually quite high. So upwards of 78% of all cysteines sh should be detectable. Um, so you can see we're still a long ways to go from full coverage, but we're getting there. Um, and one of the really intriguing things that came out of this study is that um, our, our, the peptides that we identified have actually relatively low overlap to the peptides identified in the GIGI paper, suggesting that um, the nature of the probe, the, the enrichment handle, in this case they use desthiobiotin and we use biotin, and probably most importantly the chromatography conditions can substantially impact which cysteines are getting identified. And I should just note that um, our method um, is really high throughput. And so this has enabled us to really increase our coverage and um, throughput of um, chemoproteomic samples that we process. Um, and so I, I hinted at the beginning that we'd get back to function and I'll just give you a, a teaser. Um, so another PhD student in my lab, Maria Palafox has really taken on this question of how do we assay or how do we identify functional cysteines in a high throughput manner? And what she's done is um, taken a multiomic approach where we go from our chemoproteomic data through to uh, predictions of pathogenicity. So these are genetic scores um, that are uh, generated on the DNA level. So we're basically reverse translating back from protein to DNA. Um, and then from this information, we can start to make interesting observations about which cysteines are predicted likely to be damaging to the protein based on human genetics, and then come back and start to assay whether those predictions hold up in the protein level. And so in this case, we found a cysteine in, again, our favorite protein caspase 8. It's a non-catalytic cysteine, not annotated as functional, that if we mutate it, it completely knocks out protein activity. And so this is intriguing because it shows that um, if you can integrate different layers of um, data from chemoproteomics through to genetics, we can start to improve our ability to predict uh, cysteine functionality. So with that, I'll just wrap up and hopefully I've convinced you of um, some things at least, if nothing else, that chemoproteomics is really a powerful technique to identify druggable proteins. Uh, suzuki mirar cross-coupling is a, a nice biorthogonal reaction that can function complementary to uh, click chemistry and that the combination of FAMES ion mobility as well as this SP3 sample cleanup can really increase coverage of labeled cysteines. Um, and so obviously there was a ton of work that went into all of this and a huge number of um, my number of my group members have contributed to these projects shown in red. Um, and we're really grateful for funding from a number of agencies. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Carrie Ann. That's brilliant. I think Zoom is a very powerful way to capture all group members in one photo. <laughs> um, we've got one question in the Q&A, and I encourage the audience, please, to add some more. Um, so please use the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, but the first question from Jamin, how many cysteines, roughly speaking, lie beyond the scope of triptych digestion? So I guess how many are you missing because there's no arginine or lysine or glutamate? Uh, in the vicinity. So, Jameen, that was actually a question I really thought, I think I have a slide and I may have gone through this so quickly that it wasn't there, but I thought there'd be more. Um, so I think 80% of the human cystinome is within triptych digest length um, based on our in silico analysis, which I really thought would be lower based on all the chemoproteomics experiments that I've done. So I don't think that triptych digest is really the, the main problem. I think there's some other issues in terms of abundance and ionization and you know chromatography issues. Um, okay, I've got one that's come up in the chat, but we hope most of them will be in the Q&A, please. Uh, maybe I missed it, but did you apply libraries to find starting points similar to Gigi? 
Uh, we we have not. So we have taken a bit of a step back, as you'll see from small molecule screening and just to, to sort of taken some time to try to optimize our chemoproteomic platform. And so we're just getting back to library screening now um, with sort of the improved chemoproteomic platform. And then from Denise, what is the advantage of finding all cysteines versus just solvent accessible cysteines? I think, so that's a great question. And that's a sort of hints at something that we've swapped out in our methods. We've gone from alkylating only um, fully sort of native proteins to denatured proteins to really try to capture everything. And I think the advantage there is twofold. One is that there are cryptic cysteines that don't seem to be in solvent accessible pockets um, based on crystal structures, at least. Um, the other advantage is there's some other downstream applications you can envision for this sort of cysteine chemoproteomics, for example, redox proteomics, if you want to assay disulfides, um, that maybe assaying just those solvent accessible ones would be not, you know, as, as favorable. Um, so we, we've got a bunch of related proteomic questions, which maybe I can summarize uh, all together. So a few people are touching on uh, what other proteolytic enzymes you might try and how much you have concerns about unassigned spectra. So proteolytic enzymes is easy. We've tried, um, I think we've tried chymotrypsin and um, lice and we haven't touched aspen yet. Um, and the enzymes do help marginally, um, not as much as I would have thought. Um, you know, I, I sort of went into this thinking that enzymes would be the silver bullet and we try more enzymes and that'll fix everything. Um, unassigned spectra, I think, is actually a bigger problem. And I think there potentially is some problems with fragmentation of some of these proteomic enzyme capture enzymes that were not fully appreciated in their initial development um, that might lead to greater uh, on this, you know, misassigned or unassigned spectra. Um, and maybe a question for me, what do you think is out there in this great unknown then of unexplored system space? Like for, for all the compounds we've already characterized and we say, oh, they're very selective. Do you think they are still selective because that part of the proteome we don't see is perhaps not targeted? Or do you think actually whatever hit rate we see for the visible part we'll see also in the undetected part? I think, in our experience, at least, I don't think the hit rate is going to go up orders of magnitude. As you start sampling more cysteines, the hit rate doesn't seem to scale with the number of cysteines, which is really comforting. And I guess that's one of the questions that I'd like to see, see answered, because if we're only sampling 2% of the cysteines, you could imagine exactly as you're saying, Alex, the, you know, the other 98% is where all the off targets are and we're not assaying mm -hmm. them. Um, and that obviously would be concerning. And I don't think we're seeing that. I think part of where this will really help is cysteines that say only show up in one in 20, one in 50 experiments, which we've probably all seen, right? The unicorn cysteine, you spotted it once and then it never showed up again. Um, and if that is the protein you're really interested in, that it would be nice to have a way to get really high coverage and consistently see all the peptides you're interested in. Um. Um, Cheryl, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, great talk, Carrie Ann. Um, so a, a lot of cysteines are involved, a lot of reduced cysteines and native proteins are involved in metal ion coordination. And so if you, when, you, when you're in your analyst, analysis of available cysteines, are you uh, including those or ruling them out? Because maybe a large proportion of the, proportion of the cysteinome is not available because of metal coordination. And therefore your 13% your your that you're accessing is, is maybe a, a higher proportion of those that are available is what I was thinking. So I think the metal binding proteins are a really intriguing fraction of the cysteinome, especially since I think the data that we showed in the 2016 Nature paper suggested that they tend to be less druggable than many other. You know, they're typically quite nucleophilic, but don't show up as very druggable. And obviously, these are really interesting cysteines because they're in zinc fingers and you know, modulating transcription, translation, and you know, obviously that would be attractive to drug. Um, for these particular studies, we are denaturing proteins and reducing all cysteines prior to alkylation, um, which I think should effectively reverse any metal complexes um, 
with the exception of maybe really high affinity ones. So I'm, I'm less concerned about that in these studies. Um, and I think that's probably also part of the motivation here of denaturing is we want to, we don't want the study to be biased based on, you know, pre alkylation or pre sample processing events. Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, we're still getting questions, but we're probably going to have to stop for time. But we will have, after the three talks, we may have time for a little short panel session. So maybe we can come back to some of these uh, further questions. I think we're delving quite deep into, into methods, methods now. So uh, I thank Carrie Ann for a really fantastic uh, first talk. Um, I should have mentioned at the start, we're having a theme today all around covalent inhibitors. Um, particularly how we target uh, the really challenging proteins, which are obviously a feature of target 2035. Um, so really delighted to move to the second talk um, from Near London. And Near is talking about teaching acrylamides new tricks. Hi everyone, I hope you can see my slide. Uh, so thanks for the invitation to speak in um, this uh, really interesting seminar. Uh, and um, as Alex mentioned, uh, our lab is focused uh, around covalent ligand discovery, um, which as, as many of you must have known if you come to listen to this session, uh, molecules that are able to form covalent bonds when they're target have many advantages such as increased biochemical efficiency, duration of action, and they can be very selective. Uh, and as Kerian showed, uh, there are several successful drugs, including a uh, clinical candidate for challenging targets such as KRAS. Uh, and for these reasons, we're trying to uh, develop technologies that would enable uh, the discovery or the design of new covalent inhibitors. So I'll just uh, introduce very, very shortly a few technologies we've, we've um, uh, already published, and then uh, the rest of the talk will be on an entire new project that's unpublished. And it's the first time I'm giving this talk, so uh, I really hope to get um, uh, instructive feedback. So we previously uh, developed a virtual covalent screening platform, Doc Covalent, and we applied it to several different targets uh, to straight from virtual screening come up with very potent uh, covalent binders. Then uh, an, another approach uh, is based on an empirical covalent fragment screening, uh, which sort of complements uh, covalent docking since it can access uh, more difficult pockets, uh, these cryptic pockets that Karen uh, described, uh, where uh, computer simulations have a hard time of modeling, but uh, fragments tend to be able to creep into and bind. Uh, recently published a preprint on uh, another virtual platform covalentizer, which allows you to start from a structure of a reversible binder. And then uh, based on docking, uh, it uh, gives you handles, covalent handles to covalentize your molecule and generate covalent derivatives. Uh, we've also published on functionalization of covalent binders to covalent protect through reversible covalent chemistries uh, using cyanoacrylamides. Uh, and we're now also working on covalent peptide docking and, and hopefully you'll hear more about this soon. Um, but today I wanna talk about a new type of uh, electrophile. Um, and this is a derivative of acrylamides. So uh, these same three molecules uh, also show, uh, was shown in Carey's talk since uh, these are the poster child for uh, covalent drugs. So a fatinib, a covalent EGFR inhibitor, a brutinib BTK inhibitor, AMG510 is a, a clinical candidate uh, against KRAS G12C. And they all feature uh, an acrylamide uh, in this case, a beta substituted acrylamide, uh, which is by far the most prevalent electrophile or, or warhead uh, used in covalent drug discovery. Uh, and so the, the theory in the field or, or the experience uh, summarized really nice in, in this uh, paper uh, from 2014 is that if you take an acrylamide, uh, if you substitute it at either the alpha or the beta position, uh, you make it for, for hysterical reasons uh, less reactive. Uh, unless uh, if you put an electron withdrawing group at the alpha position, such, such as a cyano group, you make it more reactive, but also you endow it with reversibility. 
Uh, and so when in one of our projects in the lab, we synthesized this molecule, this alpha-substituted acrylamide, uh, and tried to label a target protein in it, uh, we were certain it would give us um, a less reactive compound with maybe increased selectivity. But what we actually got by uh, the mass of the labeled protein is that uh, the protein was labeled with what seemed to be a full acrylamide. Uh, and uh, Rambabu Reddy, a postdoc fellow in my lab, very talented, uh, figure out the mechanism for uh, this reaction is instead of a typical Michael addition, um, methacrylamides substitute at the alpha position actually go through a conjugate addition elimination reaction, whereas the first addition step uh, brings the electrons to the oxygen. And then when it comes back, instead of um, removing the proton here, it kicks out the leaving group off of the methacrylamide, leaving you with a protein that's covalently labeled now with an acrylamide on the protein and a leaving group. And then when we looked into the literature, actually very recently similar chemistry uh, was proposed for bioconjugation chemistry um, in these two papers. Um, and thought we, we thought to uh, develop this chemistry further uh, and to characterize it. So to do that, we, we made some model compounds. So here an acrylamide based on a benzyl uh, amine. And uh, at the alpha position, we put uh, in this compound, we put a hydroxycumarin, reacted this with glutathione, and then this could either go to the conjugate addition elimination reaction, releasing uh, the uh, coumarin, or the traditional microaddition giving us this adduct. And to follow the reaction, we used uh, LCMS. And so you can see here that uh, half an hour after starting the reaction, we, we have the starting material. We already have some released coumarin and some substituted glutathione that matches in its uh, mass to this uh, product and not to the Michael addition. And after 48 hours, we don't have any more storing material. It's completely released the coumarin and all the glutathione is substituted in this form. So this, this compound 100% uh, went through the conjugate addition elimination pathway. Uh, and when we follow the reaction at different time points, we can see that the rate of coumarin release and GSH uh, adduct formation is exactly equivalent to the rate of uh, the decrease in the starting material. Uh, and this means that we can actually follow the reaction much more easily by following the fluorescence uh, of the coumarin. And indeed here you can see that as a function of different glutathione concentrations, uh, we can increase the rate of the reaction and can follow it very nicely using fluorescence. Uh, and actually when we follow with fluorescence the rate of the reactions, both as a function of the, the starting material, varying the, the, the starting material or varying the glutathione concentration, we get linear relationships, which means that the, the first step, the addition step uh, of the reaction is what, what determines um, the, it's the, it's the rate limiting step of the reaction. So we made a, a bunch of model compounds, all based on this uh, benzylamine-based uh, acrylamide, uh, with various substitutions, either of uh, hen, uh, or nitrogen um, heterosubstitutions or oxygen heterosubstitutions, phenols, uh, carbonates, esters, etc. Uh, and for each of those, we measured the reaction rate as well as. Uh, does the reaction go through the Michael addition or through the uh, new substitution reaction? So for uh, the simple acrylamide with no substitution, uh, the T half of glutathione is very long. It's, it's not very reactive uh, and it goes through the uh, regular Michael addition. When there's only a methyl here, it conforms to sort of the norms uh, that we know that alpha substitutions make the reaction, uh, the, the, the acrylamide very non-reactive and it, it actually, we couldn't measure the, the reaction, doesn't go th through any reaction. Uh, but then most of the other uh, heterosubstituted methacrylamides uh, went through the substitution reaction, um, with an exception of, of some nitrogen-based compounds that showed a mix of both addition and substitution. Uh, but interestingly, when we follow the T half of glutathione, so the glutathione consumption um, as a function of, of the substitution, we see a very nice correlation between the thiol reactivity and the pKa uh, in the case of, of uh, acid uh, or pKb in the case of bases. Uh, so the, it's, it's very predictable 
what the thiol reactivity be as a function of the leaving group, uh, which, which is a very nice property if you want to attenuate your electrophile. Uh, one nice application for uh, this new type of electrophile uh, corresponds very nicely with uh, Carrion's talk. Uh, so we, we made the following three compounds where we have uh, an acrylamide with an alkyne group uh, and, and various leaving group uh, off of the uh, alpha uh, position. Uh, and when these will react with the cysteine in a protein, this leaving group will go and all three compounds, despite having different recognition elements, would leave the exact same tag, the same alkyne tag uh, on their target protein. And so these can be used as, as tags for chemoproteome uh, and when we uh, click them with uh, Tamra Eyeside and uh, image on gels, you can see that uh, they have different reactivities as we, as we uh, saw in the, in the previous slide. This corresponds to the reactivities uh, with glutathione where uh, 2C was the least reactive of the three compounds. Uh, all, all three of them are less reactive than uh, iodoacetamide alkyne, uh, but importantly, they have different coverage uh, from one another and from iodocetamide alkyne. So you can uh, imagine how pools of these types of probes uh, can give you increased coverage in chemoproteomic screens. Uh, but then what we were really interested in was to explore this chemistry in the context of targeted covalent uh, inhibition. So to do that, we took ibrutinib, uh, which is, uh, as I said, an approved drug uh, targeting the BTK kinase. And then uh, we installed uh, onibrutinib, and actually the chemistry to, to install these uh, is very straightforward, and you can start from the acrylamide. And we installed various um, hetero substitution uh, on the alpha position of the methacrylamide. Uh, and it's very similar to the, the model compounds that I showed you previously, uh, most of the compounds underwent the conjugate addition elimination reaction, uh, but few of the nitrogen-based compounds uh, went a, a mixture of, of Michael addition uh, and elimination. Um, but uh, very interestingly, if we compare, so this is uh, labeling, percent labeling of BTK in an intact protein uh, mass spectrometry experiment, um, you can see that almost all compounds show the same labeling rates as ibrutinib. So this is actually too fast to measure be, uh, below five minutes for almost all of the compounds. Uh, the two exceptions that you see here uh, in pink uh, is this compound that uh, is the slowest to react. And it, the same was with the uh, model compound that had this su substitution. Uh, and this compound, which is the naked methacrylamide, which we know is, is much, much less reactive. So uh, we get the same reactivity uh, as ibrutinib. Uh, if we test these in in vitro kinase activity assays, you can see that actually a few of the compounds, and this, this is not uh, the curves for all of them, just a representative set, a few of the compounds are actually more potent uh, than ibrutinib uh, in kinase uh, assays, which is um, kind of astounding since ibrutinib is a 200 uh, picomolar uh, inhibitor. Um, while others are, are somewhat less uh, potent, uh, and again, the, the methacrylamide, the naked methacrylamide is, is much, much less potent uh, than ibrutinib, so we can span uh, a wide range of inhibition. Uh, in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Ziv Schulman from the Weizmann Institute, we also show that uh, these are actually active in cells. So this is uh, an experiment in primary B cells measuring the inhibition of uh, BCR signaling uh, in, in, in B cells from mice that are activated with an anti-IgM antibody. And you can see uh, four of these compounds are actually comparable to ibrutinib in terms of their uh, dose response uh, in primary cells. Um, so uh, on the one hand, we, we have a way to modulate the compounds to be, to be even slightly more potent uh, from ibrutinib, uh, but then you would say, okay, but what happens to the selectivity? And here we got another surprise. So whereas uh, on the y-axis, this is the IC50, some compounds are more potent than ibrutinib, we're surprised to realize that uh, is the, their glutathione reactivity is actually lower than that of ibrutinib. So we have uh, improved potency, uh, but maybe also improved selectivity. 
And so to sort of uh, prove that they uh, indeed have improved selectivity and not only just lowered thiol reactivity, uh, we did two chemoproteomics experiment. Uh, the first using uh, a method from, or an analogous method to one reported by uh, Stefan Hacker group. Uh, we used a dead thiobiotin uh, probe to do uh, isotope uh, ABPP. Uh, so we compete basically uh, our compounds uh, with this yodoacetamide uh, alkyne probe. Uh, and here you can see that in the top um, labeling targets, so targets that have a ratio above three, we do see a slight selectivity advantage for the two compounds it tested. Only 31 and 33 targets were, um, were found compared to 43 targets for uh, ibrutinib, so a slight, slight uh, improvement in selectivity. However, none of the um, kinase targets of, of ibrutinib actually showed here, so, so maybe this is a set of, of off-target that is somewhat less interesting. So in order to, to see what's happening uh, in the actually interesting uh, off-target target of these compounds. We did a second uh, chemoproteome experiment now using ibrutinib alkyne uh, as the probe and then uh, competing with our compound this alkyne, uh, doing a pull down. Uh, and now we look uh, at the entire protein levels instead of only the labeled peptide here. Uh, and if we're focusing here only on um, enrichments above uh, twofold uh, and uh, only significant p-values, uh, there are very few targets that are actually picked up. Uh, and again, we see a slight selectivity advantage of about twofold where ibrutinib picks up 11 uh, significant targets and, and our compounds picks up only five or six. Uh, but very satisfyingly, BTK is by far uh, the most significant target for all three compounds. And then uh, BLK, uh, which is a known off-target of ibrutinib, uh, and, and CDK1, interestingly, is also found as a, a consensus off-target. Uh, so these uh, experiments gave us a sense that in the cells, they're slightly more selective, but to really um, uh, put it more quantitatively, we tested in in vitro biochemical inhibition, uh, their IC50s against the five uh, top off target of uh, ibrutinib. Uh, and you can see here against BTK, this is ibrutinib in blue. All four compounds are slightly more potent uh, than ibrutinib. Uh, but against the off targets, uh, Almost all, all of the compounds, and uh, by far the uh, pink and the orange one, are less potent against the off targets. And uh, here's the quantification. If we only look at ibrutinib versus 3H and 3I, you can see that, for instance, uh, for BLK, we have an order of magnitude higher selectivity uh, than uh, ibrutinib. Uh, here against ITK, again, an order and a half of magnitude. Uh, and against RB2 and EGFR, uh, we get close to two logs uh, more selective uh, with these compounds uh, over ibrutinib. So this is uh, a nice method to uh, improve both the potency uh, as well as perhaps the selectivity of targeted covalent inhibitors uh, and also to modify uh, some, uh, some of their other properties such as cell permeability, uh, perhaps PKPD uh, and, and other properties. Uh, but maybe uh, a more exciting uh, sort of feature of these compounds, as I showed you with the mono compound, we can functionalize the inhibitors uh, with, with some interesting leaving groups. So we made this uh, derivative of ibrutinib with a, a, a coumarin as a leaving group. And you can see here that uh, BTK on its own is not fluorescent. The compound on its own is not fluorescent since uh, the coumarin is uh, connected. There's no negative charge here. Uh, but as soon as we incubate them together, uh, we get very high fluorescence, which is too fast to measure. Uh, in order to try and uh, lower the, the kinetics, we incubate it with uh, ibrutinib amine, which is the non-covalent ibrutinib, just with an NH here. Uh, and this uh, allowed us to slow down the reaction, but since uh, the probe is covalent, it's out of equilibrium, and over time, uh, we cum accumulate this fluorescence. Uh, and by following with uh, LCMS, we can show that the adduct actually corresponds uh, to ibrutinib with this coumarin leaving. Uh, we show that we can also slow down the reaction by really reducing the concentration of BTK to 50 nanomolar. Uh, we, we show that it's specific, so there is no reaction with BSA at 10 micromolar. Uh, and also we can block this reaction by uh, pre-labeling BTK with yodoacetamide, for instance. 
uh, to show generality, we show similar probes for uh, a derivative of a fat inib. This is a fat inib with just a methoxy here. Um, uh, so this also works and also give uh, the the right the correct mass of the adduct uh, on EGFR and with the derivative of AMG uh, 510 and uh, KRAS G12C, uh, we can see a clear fluorescent signal as a function of uh, adding the compounds to the protein. And again, KRAS is labeled with the uh, right molecular mass. Uh, so this is a, a general sort of approach to make turn-on fluorescence probe from targeted covalent inhibitors. Um, we, we try to functionalize with uh, another sort of chemistry. Uh, so Doron Shabbat's group developed this very nice um, dioxetane uh, chemiluminescence approach, where if we cleave this bond and, and release the O- group, uh, there's a chain of electron transfer that ends up in open the dioxetane and releasing uh, a photon, emitting a photon. And so here you can see the uh, luminescence profile uh, and you can see a massive peak uh, in luminescence uh, only when adding both the protein and the compound, whereas uh, no luminescence for the protein or the compound alone. And again, we can compete this with the reversible ibrutinib derivative. Uh, so block this luminescence. Uh, and to show the utility of sim such probes, we, we did just a proof of concept, uh, proof of concept small high throughput screening um, campaign with this. Uh, so we took uh, uh, 3,500 uh, bioactive molecules from the SELEC library. Uh, and you can see that uh, kinase inhibitors were heavily enriched in their ability to block this luminescence, where ibrutinib can uh, block it completely. Uh, whereas some other non-kinase inhibitor uh, compounds were also able to, to bind to BTK. Uh, this is just another representation uh, of the same data where you can see that all known BTK inhibitors uh, in the set uh, gave close to 100% inhibition. Uh, and out of this set, we, we filter it down to the top 25 and, and we showed that we can get nice IC50 curves from them. Uh, and for the top four compounds, uh, we tested both uh, IC50 using our probes, and, and they're all pretty similar to ibrutinib. Uh, we tested them also uh, for uh, phospho-BTK inhibition. You can see here ibrutinib. Uh, and for some of these compounds, we get lower than 16 nanomolar uh, inhibition in cells. And I should mention that, that none of these were uh, labeled as BTK inhibitors or were annotated previously uh, to be BTK um, inhibitors. So uh, BTK is just a very potent off-target uh, for these kinase uh, inhibitors. So to summarize, um, I showed you that alpha-substituted methacrylamides are a new class of electrophiles uh, that can show improved potency, selectivity, uh, and tunable reactivity. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the added vector for optimization, so now you can, you can add more recognition to your protein by going to the other side of the acrylamide, uh, also gives you a, a nice way to optimize uh, acrylamides uh, in a late-stage functionalization uh, manner. Uh, and uh, also importantly, I showed you that uh, covalent ligand directed release or colder chemistry, as we coined this, um, uh, inspired by Hitaru Amachi's uh, ligand directed chemistries, uh, can functionalize covalent inhibitors. Uh, I showed you a turn on flu fluorophore, a turn on uh, luminophore. Uh, we also made a uh, turn on uh, toxin. So upon binding, we release some toxin. Uh, or uh, an inhibitor of another target, uh, which may allow us uh, synthetic uh, lethal inhibition of two targets in the cell. Um, and, and we're now optimizing and characterizing these uh, for cellular and in vivo applications. And just wanna finish by uh, thanking my awesome group. Uh, this is a photo from pre-COVID area, uh, uh, the, the times before COVID and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, back there soon as, as about half of Israel is now fully vaccinated. Uh, Ram is the chemist that uh, made all the chemistry in this project. Efrat was responsible for the protein work, Ronan for the chemoproteomics, and Adi for the uh, BTK assay in cells. Uh, and I thank you and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Nir. We've also got a few questions for you in the uh, Q&A box now. Um, Philip asks, um, is this a strategy to release a toxic payload or combination therapy with a single drug? Do you think this is plausible? 
imagine having a payload tethered to KRAS G12C ligand and releasing the toxic payload only in mutated cancer cells, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I think it's highly plausible. It's something we're actively pursuing. Um, I, I do have to say there are some um, challenges in working with these uh, in cells. So the permeability may become an issue where you, you put two big compounds uh, together. Uh, also reactivity, uh, we're still sort of learning the regimes of this electrophile, uh, but that's certainly a, a direction we're taking. I think it, it has a lot of promise. And, and Stephen asks, um, of course, you showed some IC50s there, but you know, for irreversible inhibitors, have you also looked at KI values or KNACT? Right. Uh, no, we, we haven't done so. Uh, it's, uh, these are more challenging when you're looking at such uh, potent picomolar inhibitors uh, for BTK. It's very challenging to measure uh, KI or KNACT. Uh, so we use, we use IC50s as proxies. Okay, uh, the question's coming thick and fast now. Um, I think somebody here has pointed out that uh, the alpha amino methylcoprinamide mechanism um, was published by AstraZeneca in the 2013 EGFR paper in JMED Chem. So I don't know, maybe had you seen that or? I think I, I think I saw it and I think they, uh, they sort of, they used it to, uh, th they did see the leaving group mechanism uh, but they didn't really pursue it. Yeah, we, we saw it, we, we, they sort of uh, published it, but but didn't follow up. Like they said, they, they wanted to install a, a solubilizing group there, like a morpholine, uh, and the morpholine left. Uh, so it's, it's sort of anecdotal, yeah, anecdotal um, example of this mechanism. Good point. And um, have you evaluated the effect of different substituents, the methylchromides, on cell permeability in flux efflux? You know, could that no, explain differences in IC50s? No, we, we haven't. We haven't characterized uh, cellular properties so far to too much depth. Um, where are we? Okay. Do you foresee coal LDR platforms to be generalizable? appended to KBO5 light ligands for screening the yet to be drugged proteome? What would be the biggest challenge? Yeah, so uh, I, I do think they'll, they'll have a big impact of, on, on proteomics. So one example was this uh, chemoproteomics approach that, that I showed. Um, I think you know, the challenge would be to, to balance the reactivity. There, there are more reactive than uh, acrylamides. So uh, I, I think this will be more clear once uh, the first chemoproteomic set uh, will, will, will be found, will be published. Um, and then have you compared the effect of advantages of substituting alpha versus beta and gamma uh, positions? Right. So. Uh, as far as I know, uh, substituting the beta position, you can get this elimination um, uh, effect. So, uh, I mean, it, it, you, you typically reduce the reactivity of your electrophile, but you can't really functionalize it. So, so I think, you know, there, I, I showed two sort of directions of, of where you can take this chemistry. One is for optimizations of molecule and, and the second is for their functionalization. So I think beta substitution might help you optimize selectivity, for instance, of, of your compound, but not really functionalize them in interesting ways. Mm. Um, have you any experience on the DM DMPK properties? Uh, no, not anything robust. We, we did try, uh, very, very, very preliminary in vivo uh, studies, and and we do show some some activity with the chemoluminophore, but uh, too too preliminary for me to comment. Okay, and the final question before we move on: um, Your probes leave an acrylamide on the protein target. Uh, is this still reactive towards other proteins or ligands? Yeah, so uh, it is, and we're actually we have a, a small follow up study where we show we can actually use this installed acrylamide to screen for, uh, for binders for the same pocket. Since you, you sort of put an acrylamide next to a pocket, then if some, in some molecule, uh, for instance, with a thiol or a free amine binds close enough, it can label that acrylamide and you can measure that by LCMS. Uh, so, so that's a sort of nice follow-up for that. Perfect.
Lovely, thanks. Um, if there are any more questions uh, for Neil, we can maybe come back to them in the panel discussion. Um, so now I'd like to ask uh, Nick Matessio to share his screen. And uh, Nick is going to give us a talk uh, about some of his platforms at McGill and at uh, Molecular Forecaster. Thank you, Alex. Do you see my screen? We do, yes. Okay, th thanks a lot. And thanks to the organizers for this great invitation. It's a privilege to be uh, giving a quick summary of what we've been doing for the past uh, 10 years or so in, um, in the field of covalent drugs. <clears throat> so um, I'm Nick Motessier, for those who don't know, know me, uh, I'm the CSO, a co-founder of Molecular Forecaster and uh, as well as a professor at McGill University, both in, in Montreal. And yes, we do have snow. We have a major snowstorm on, on its way. So if you're wondering whether Canada is cold, yes, it is, and it's snowy. Um, <clears throat> all right, so just to give a, a brief summary of how we approach things. So in my lab, we're developing software. So in, in, in a way, somewhat very similar to uh, what Nier has described, we're developing a platform for drug discovery. Um, we're synthesizing molecules that are based on predictions. And then we, we run the uh, uh, biological evaluations uh, and we're feeding this back to the software for um, uh, improvement uh, of, the, of the software. And at the end, what we have is on one side, we're producing potent molecules, uh, hopefully, and on the other side, we're producing accurate software. So in, in a nutshell, what is uh, our software? So we have a platform for drug discovery called uh, Forecaster that is mostly built around two major tools. One is our docking program called Fitted that has been uh, developed and optimized for a number of uh, not so usual targets. Uh, including covalent drugs, methanol enzymes, uh, nucleic acids. And our second program, a second major program is IMPACT that predicts uh, the uh, P450s uh, mediated uh, metabolism of drugs. All right, so let's focus a bit, uh, a bit further and let's look at FITID per se. So FITID specificities are uh, manifold. First, it, it considers the protein flexibility when you're docking. This was based on, uh, on work that we've done on base one inhibitors. As I said um, in the first slide, our approach is always based on a, on a medicine and chemistry pro project. Then we implementing what, what we need for that given project. Then we, uh, so we've implemented protein flexibility when looking at base one inhibitors for Alzheimer's disease. We've implemented displaceable water molecules for aminoglycosides, a number of tools for covalent docking, um, metal coordination for a, a variety of metal enzymes, including HDAP inhibitors. And we're currently working on, on improving the docking program for nucleic acids. All right, so what's interesting is our program is, is uh, not only used in our lab, it's also used by a number of countries in the world. Um, we have, if I recall the latest number, we have about 30 countries now um, uh, where FITID is used. And these are two comparative studies that are completely independent from our lab. And you see that FITID uh, on the left for a regular docking and virtual screening on, on, if I recall, six proteins, six enzymes, was actually uh, outperforming uh, the major docking programs out there. And separately, there's a, there was a comparative study on covalent docking uh, done by the Keseru Group in, in Hungary, looking at a variety of different programs that are um, considering covalent docking. And you see FITID is actually here. Um, I'll get back to this uh, gray zone um, uh, later in this talk. All right, so let's focus a little bit further. And now let's look at covalent uh, docking covalent drugs. And when you're approaching this problem from the uh, computational chemistry standpoint, you need really to, uh, to consider a number of challenges. One is how do we identify whether a molecule includes what we call a warhead, so reactive functional group. Um, either you can manually define them one by one, which obviously precludes the use of these programs for large filter screening. You certainly do not want to um, identify covalent groups one by one on millions of compounds. You can have automatic identification of reactive functions. How do we decide which bonds are formed, which bonds are broken? Um, doc covalent, briefly mentioned by uh, uh, Nier in the previous talk, is using some um, uh, reaction uh, encoding in, in smart format. Or some other program, they simply truncate their reactive residue and, and dock in a sort of 
non-covalent fashion. And overall, what's, uh, what you want to achieve is, can we dock covalently and non-covalently in a single run? So the program would decide if the compound is covalent or not. Can we consider the reactivity of these different warheads? And can we also distinguish between reversible and irreversible inhibitors? All right, so the challenges are very often related to the chemistry itself. So we are a medicine on chemist, and we hope to be able to understand the, uh, the mechanism of these reactions. So here I'm showing one example of um, a covenant drug. Actually, there's a crystal structure of this to confirm that this is what is formed. So you're starting from this heterocycle, and then through a number of steps, you end up with this intermediate where the double bond has been isomerized. So clearly the mechanism is multi-step and cannot, can hardly be encoded easily into a, a program. So obviously this is a, a, an example of a, a case study where a normal docking program manually identifying functional groups would certainly not work. Other challenges, if you know the chemistry around uh, this type of enzymes, what you know is if you want to cleave a nemide bond, let's say using a serine protease, usually this intermediate is stabilized by what we call an oxyanion ion hole. Um, and then your, the, the reaction proceeds, then you're cleaving the amide bond. If you want to consider this in a drug design um, manner, let's say you have an aldehyde. If the aldehyde react with a serine in a covalent fashion, you may form this intermediate that may be stabilized by the oxyanion hole or not. So again, you need to understand the chemistry behind this, this process to decide whether you should stop here and whether, or whether you should stop there. In other words, the docking program should be able to distinguish between each of these different cases. There's also a stereochemistry problem. Let's look at this opening, uh, the epoxide opening uh, by a cysteine uh, residue what you have is you have an inversion of configuration on one carbon and retention of the configuration on the other carbon. If you want to predict using COVID and docking the proper adduct, you need to consider the stoichiometry. All right, so what we've done over the past uh, years is to automatically um, to implement a number of different warheads that, are, that have been reported with over 40 reactions. Um, why more warhead than reaction? It's simply like an aldehyde would react with a serine forming an imiacetal, but an, uh, an aldehyde would react with a lysine to form an imine. So obviously the, the same warhead may lead to more than one reaction. And then we looked at the chemistry itself. Okay, so we've identified five reaction classes. The first one is if you're taking this serine protease, the proton of the serine would end up on the, on the adduct, on the drug enzyme adduct. So that's one case. The second case is the proton of the reactive serine would end up on the basic residue, in this case, the histidine of the uh, serine triad. A third case is you have a reaction, the proton ends up on the, um, on, on the basic residue and the living group leaves. So now we don't have the same number of atoms at the end. Another, another kind is you're also breaking a bond here, but you don't have any living groups. Now you're opening an epoxide. And finally, the last class is there's no adhesion or proton involved in the process. Let's, say, let's look at this glutamate, uh, glutamate opening uh, beta-lactone leading to this intermediate and there's no need for any proton shift. All right, so overall, that means that if you want to be predictive for all of these different reactions, you need to understand whether the adhesion of the reacting residue goes from the residue to the probe, goes from the residue to another residue, whether you're forming and breaking bonds, what type of hybridization changes you see, an aldehyde goes from sp2 to sp3 upon reaction, whether you're releasing living groups, and what happens with the stereochemistry. All right, so how we do it? Well, let's again look at this specific reaction. First, we have this case, the case where the drug is non-covalent. The aldehyde is not reacting with the serine. In this case, the proton should be on the serine. And the trick we've used in our program is to have protons everywhere that we're turning on or off. In this non-covalent binding mode, these two protons are turned off. So you have an aldehyde, a serine, and a neutral histidine. 
If the reaction goes and you're considering an oxygen ion hole, you stop here. So you have an oxygen negatively charged. These two protons are turned off. And now this histidine is in the form of an, um, um, of an ion. And then if you don't have an oxygen ion hole, then you turn on this proton. Now you're forming an amyacetal. You remove these two protons and you have this covalent adux. So overall, what we have is we have the three cases considered simultaneously upon docking. So we can consider any of these cases. So we consider simultaneously a covalent, sorry, here or here, and a non-covalent binding modes. And the program will decide which one is the best. What about stereochemistry? Well, stereochemistry, we have simply implemented some routines to check the integrity of the stereochemistry of each of the centers. And if you're breaking a bond, you're replacing in an SN2 manner, you should have inversion. If you don't break the bond, you should have retention of stereochemistry. And this is checked at any step of the docking uh, process. All right, so this is um, a very quick summary of what, how the program works. The question is, does it work? Let me go back to what Keseru has published uh, two years ago. So as I said, he compared a number of programs. Um, in dark blue is whether the best binding pose identified by the program is uh, good. Light blue is whether the, a good pose is found in the best, in the top 10 uh, best poses. And the reason why we have a gray light here, we have a gray zone here, is simply because at this time, so in 2018, we had only a handful of warheads. And in the test set that Kaseru has used, there were a number of warheads not covered by your programs. So Kaseru was nice enough to say, I assume that the accuracy as soon as these warheads will be implemented, should be about the same ratio of accuracy as the currently implemented warhead. So since then, we've expanded the program to, as I said, a large number of warheads. We tested again. And Kessler was right. We are actually an accuracy of about 80 plus percent, close to what ICM Pro is getting on that set. And the top pose um, is nearly uh, accurate at 70% of, of the cases. So we've achieved now um, a pretty high uh, accuracy in the prediction of the binding modes. Yet we don't know if we can predict activity. So can we apply this? So again, I'll go fairly quickly over what we've uh, done in the past. Um, we have interest in two serine proteases. One is called proline oligopeptidase, POP, and one is called fibroblast activation protein, FAP. Uh, this one is involved in cancer. This, in what, this one has been found to be involved in angiogenesis, so cancer, but also uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson, inducing aggregation of uh, amyloid beta or um, alpha synuclein, a hallmark of uh, Parkinson's disease. And for the sake of time, I'll just talk about this one. All right, so in 2009, we had our very first preliminary version of the docking program. So we started some design of protein oligopeptidase inhibitors. And this is the first compound we designed. Went to the lab, synthesized this compound, plethester isomer, and a bunch of other negative controls. Um, and this is the first compound that we designed, we made out of uh, fitted prediction. We have an IC50 or 200 nanomolar. So just to, uh, to clarify, we agree that uh, K-INACT or um, kinetic studies would be more uh, um, appropriate for COVID and drugs. Yet, uh, this is reversible COVID and drugs. And as Nir said, it's much faster to get IC50, at least as a first uh, evaluation. So first molecule made 200 nanomolar. Then we moved on again using some docking based optimization. We ended up with this structure. We made it and now we have a single digit nanomolar inhibitor. So that's a much better. So we're ready to go to the next stages of the drug discovery process. That was in 2010. Unfortunately, some um, metabolism studies have shown that this molecule gets oxidized very quickly. And not only does it get oxidized, it's getting oxidized in a bunch of highly reactive species. Ring opens, um, and this, is, this becomes a reactive metabolite. So obviously that uh, obviously is the no-go for, um, uh, for this molecule. So we had to go back to the drawing board and identify new structures. So this time we've done virtual screening. We've identified this molecule. 
Um, at the time of this screening, so in 2012, uh, we didn't have in our platform any ways to identify fragments like this, Michael acceptors. So we decided, uh, based on our medicinal chemistry expertise, to optimize it in silico to get something that is more drug-like. We ended up with this molecule, went to the lab, we made the compound, a synthesis of four steps uh, for a fairly drug-like molecule that turns out to be two-digit nanomolar in vitro and was also found to work on a number of cancer cells. So this is uh, the activity in living cells. Again, um, two digits, can we go a little bit uh, lower? So we decided to uh, optimize the shape by simply reducing this phantom ring into something that would look like this, obviously with a number of stereogenic center. This required that we actually created a new um, reaction. So this is a one-step uh, reaction that we've, uh, we've developed, making this multiple stereogenic centers in one single step. And through liquid-liquid uh, separation, we're able to crash out only one um, uh, diester diesterizer, diesterizer that we can couple with this group to make the intended structure. And fortunately enough, now we have a KI of one nanomolar. So we're down to something that is at the limit of the bioassays. Synthesis is only six steps. The main problem is we're losing a number of um, sterizomers along the way. So it's not a great synthesis. And making a gram of this for more advanced assay was just a bit too difficult. All right, so we went back to the drawing board, back to this chemical series and said, can we change the um, reactive group, the warhead? Uh, the answer is, well, apparently your boronic acid is not too bad. <clears throat> what was really interesting is we're enabled to deprotect, to remove this part here, to make the actual boronic acid. So we tested the boronic ester. And we found out that uh, the pre-incubation time mattered. And we luckily enough found out that the boronic ester is actually cleave into boronic acid in the, in the cell medium. So that means that this can be used as a prodrug. We don't need to have a free boronic acid. We can simply use this type of structures. All right, so now we have a new warhead. <clears throat> we moved on. We decided to simplify the synthesis. Now we have an inhibitor that is one digit nanomolar that can be made in one step. One, the, you can buy this, you can buy this group and you can couple them. So in one step, we have a compound that is one nanomolar. All right, so this is where we are. Now we have a, a, a number of chemical series and we decided to see, okay, are these molecules truly active in for potential, as potential Parkinson's disease uh, therapeutics? So went to collaborators in Montreal um, and they have a lot of expertise in the use of stem cells to make uh, what they call mini brain models. Um, and the idea is, are we truly blocking um, the aggregation of alpha synuclein in neurons? And the answer is yes. There's five molecules, so we tested over 60 uh, molecules that we designed and made. We compared it to the positive control, which is a, a proline oligopeptidase inhibitor that is known to block aggregation of alpha synuclein in, in neurons. So it's we're doing this on living neurons. So the molecule is going to the neurons, inside the neurons, blocks the aggregation of synuclein is something that we can measure uh, with level as high as 98% um, inhibition of this aggregation. So we have, now we're at a stage where we'd like to move on to the next stages of the drug discovery process, because we truly have molecules that are working in living cells. All right, um, COVID-19 uh, hit last winter. No need to, uh, to describe what this, this is about. The question is, can we develop co potent covalent inhibitors? And can we develop dual covalent inhibitors? Uh, something that we've been working on for 10 years on anti-cancer um, drugs is to find molecules that are not only covalent, but also dual. So binding two proteins at the same time. All right, so we, have a, we had a strategy that was very similar to the one that Nia presented as well. We actually published pretty much at the same time. The idea is, can we, make, can we take this non-covenant molecule and convert it into a covenant one? And this is what we've achieved. Um, acrylamide is here. 
Uh, we've tested a number of covenant groups. Uh, we've also changed uh, the different groups around. Um, and just to show just the covenant part, and by the way, in here, we use also the same synthesis, um, so um, a huggy reaction. And we found a couple of those, including the acrylamide um, and some others that are actually uh, single digit macromolar and this one that is slightly below one micromolar. And now we we completing some optimization uh, to get uh, even better potencies, mostly looking at this one and this one. All right, so just as a proof that there are covenants. So we, we're about to get a crystal structure, which we don't have one yet, but we, um, uh, in a, on a regular basis, run time-dependent potency. So you can see the, uh, the, the IC50 changes over time, indicating that this is probably a covenant uh, drug. And we've also done, we're doing this also on a regular basis. This is the mass of the protein. You're adding the inhibitor, and now you have a new mass, which um, corresponds to the protein plus the inhibitor. So we know the, the this drug is covenant. A crystal structure would obviously be the ideal and, and definite proof. All right, so we now can design molecule one by one. Can we do virtual screening? Uh, I've shown that it worked on protein oligopeptidase. It also did work here. So we're using the Zinc database and other databases. We're computing descriptors. We're selecting only molecule with potential warheads. Um, the docking program would re select representative campus. We're gonna dock them. We're gonna do a bit of a visual inspection. And, and for PL Pro, we've selected 100 potential hits molecules. For 3CL Pro, we selected about 50. And we tested them. Uh, we found some weak um, inhibitors, uh, again, directly from VS, no optimization yet. We found by doing a time-dependent IC50 that they are, the three of them are binding covenantly. So that's a good proof. And obviously we're working on optimizing them now in a more traditional medicinal chemistry approach. Uh, we've done the same for PR Pro. We have this one, which is 22 micromolar. Um, until very recently, i.e. three days ago, most of the, uh, all of the PR Pro inhibitors were uh, at best micromolar. So we pretty, pretty close. Uh, one came out uh, three days ago in Bioraca that is uh, 0.1 micromolar. Uh, thank Josh for sending me, sending this uh, along. Um, and we found three chemical series, again, with weak potency, yet very consistent uh, potency. So we're pretty good. Uh, we're on, the, on this uh, good uh, path now, and we're optimizing, again, using a more traditional medicinal chemistry approach, this uh, current heat molecule. All right, so that was, a, as I said, a quick and fast overview of what uh, we've done so far in the COVID and drug field. So we've worked hard on developing fitted into something that can be used um, uh, on different targets. We have now shown that we have an accurate binding mode prediction, that this program can be effective in finding hits in vitro screening. We've shown a couple of applications um, and this cannot be uh, doable without uh, amazing coworkers. So all uh, of these persons are um, uh, people working um, with me at Miguel. Uh, this is the four people I'm working with as molecular forecaster. The CEO is Josh Patel, that I, you might have uh, heard of. So if there's any question about molecular forecaster, would be the one to talk to. And finally, if you're interested in the program, just drop me an email. Uh, my email is here, and I'll be happy uh, to discuss the av availability of the software and to give you access to it. Thanks, Thank Nick. Um, we've got the first question is, um, what do the COVID inhibitors, what's their selectivity over the cathepsins? We and haven't tried yet, we, we're not there yet. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to make variants of the COVID-19 enzymes and we're trying to add a number of other enzymes, trying to see if we're selective, but we're not there yet. Okay. Are you collaborating on that project? For example, you mentioned you needed crystal structures and things like that. <laughs> I, ha I have someone at Miguel who was, uh, was gonna run it, uh, but I, I, otherwise I know I should have talked to, uh, to Nier <laughs> to get some crystal structures, that's for sure. But no, we have someone who's, um, we, we've just made um, a large amount of the protein on, on our way to get a crystal structure. And you, you opened your talk with some of the discussion on setting up software for docking in terms of active and inactive protons and things like this. So 
how much of that can you incorporate if you're doing the sort of larger scale VLS type approaches? How much is the compromise there? Um, you, you, you mean uh, the automation or? Yeah, yeah. Everything is fully automated. You don't have to care about this. Okay. Uh, so so we, we're taking really, tr uh, really the Zing database and we're screening it without doing anything else. The program is automating all the reactions. So we have, um, they're hard coded. So obviously it's limited to the reaction that we have encoded. But the proton exchanges and all of this is considered automatically. Okay, so we, we have a question actually on the speed of the program. So, you know, in terms of virtual screening of a large compound library, do you have um, any comments on, on speed? So the, the, the program takes a few minutes per compound. So we usually docking from 10,000 to 100,000 compounds. So we're using some other of our, our programs to uh, set, select the right uh, library. For instance, we, we have, I think, a library of something like maybe 12 or 13,000 molecules that have a, a covenant warhead uh, because there's just no others. Uh, so we limit it to the number of available molecules that could be covenant drugs as well. Okay. And then we can run this in just a matter of, uh, of days. So I think that's the last question. So we'll stop there. And I thank uh, Nick, Kerry, Anne, and Nir for all the fabulous talks. And um, we're a bit short of thank time, you. but we've got a couple of minutes left um, for any follow-up uh, panel discussions and discussion. Um, so first of all, I'll start with the panel members who are on screen. Are there any particular follow-up questions you would like to raise? Paul, Cheryl, all the speakers to one another. Okay. Just to mention, Nick, that uh, we published uh, about 10 or 15 crystal structures from that uh, series, the Oogie series with- uh, I'm, I'm aware of it. <laughs> I'm aware so of it, yeah. The, the hypothesis holds and they do bind in the, in the predicted binding mode. And I'm sure the chloroacetamide uh, will bind better because of the higher yeah. uh, reactivity, but uh, the alpha ketoamide looks, looks exciting. Um, yeah. Also, you may, um, uh, we did a lot of optimization uh, around the, the UGI uh, substituents. So, and, and one of them was particularly potent, like uh, I think more than 30 fold. So uh, maybe that can drive down the potency of your uh, yep. alpha chloro. Um, um, I, I, alpha yeah, I think we should, have, we should have a discussion offline because I'd be interested to see all of your data, like, like detailed data. So that we don't reduce something that has been done that we not may not necessarily have access to, just to, uh, for the sake of. We have about, I don't know, we have about 70 or 80 compounds right now, analogs. I know that you made over 100, if I recall. Yeah, maybe close to 300 now, but I think all is, I'll send you the links. Everything is available online. Okay. Okay, and then um, I know when we cut off, uh, carry on, there were a couple of uh, questions that you wanted to come back to. Have those been answered, Kerry Ann, or would you like to uh, raise a few answers for the audience here as well? Um, I think I answered, I tried to answer everything in the chat. Um, right now, it's, it's so early here, I'm just waking up. Um, <laughs> the Probably the thing that seemed like the most relevant, interesting to talk about would be the um, ways to get to higher coverage of cysteines, um, which I'd say is still very much an open question. You know, lots of interesting comments about proteases. I personally think the, the way forward is going to be um, potentially looking at more primary human tissues, because I think right now we're all kind of sampling the same cancer cell lines and the cancer proteomes are probably very different than if you go into more interesting and intriguing human tissues. Uh, at least that would be one big thing that I think all of us as a community should start thinking about more. Um, also different contexts. So Ben just published his work on, on activated T cells versus, uh, you know, with, with uh, under different sort of activation conditions or stress conditions. Uh, you expose or you activate uh, a different set of proteins and the chemoproteomic profile looks completely different. Are there any general lessons we should draw in terms of covalent ligand development for target 2035? You know, we've learned about particular proteomics and, and capturing selectivity, but um, from a chemistry perspective, do you, do you think there are certain um, starting considerations that one should 
bear in mind in terms of starting off covalent projects? Well, I think if I can answer, again, it, it, it depends whether you want a probe or whether you want a drug. Uh, our chloral um, compound is nice as a probe. I'm not sure it's going to survive as a drug. Um, so the, there are considerations like the acrylamide is, is, I think, a very good deal because it's uh, probably safe enough uh, to get to, uh, to the drug level. Uh, some other ones, uh, not necessarily, but again, it depends on what you want to achieve. Uh, our molecules right now are probably good probes. They're probably not uh, drug candidates. Um, so that's one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is is obviously selectivity. This was uh, this was asked. Um, we're not there yet on this project, but this is truly something we have to consider. And maybe another interest we have is on membrane proteins. So I wondered if any of the speakers have also looked at potential ligands in that space, and certainly in the proteomic space, that presents another challenge. Any comments there? Maybe carry on on your proteomics. So we've tried some crude fractionation, our recent chem biochem paper, like your know, membrane soluble fractionation. And um, you there are cysteines in the membrane that are reactive. I'd say there's substantially fewer, um, which probably isn't so surprising. Um, the sort of intriguing thing we found from that is you don't get a huge increase in coverage when you do those sorts of like crude fractionations, potentially like more rigorous. You know, I think Aranthi's done some beautiful work fractioning out like the ER and mitochondria. And I think that really helps, but just crude membrane soluble for coverage doesn't help that much. Um, but yeah, th there's definitely cysteine there. There's probably work that needs to be done in terms of whether or not, you know, the way we do the fractionation is pretty crude, maintaining those proteins in an appropriately folded state. And then those are probably more biased towards long, long peptides that aren't triptych, you know, sites, transmembrane domains that might have cysteines could be really interesting and we're probably not sampling them. Um, uh, I would have a question for, for you, Karian. Um, you mentioned the number of cysteines uh, that could be targeted, but I would assume some are in zinc fingers, some are in disulfide bridges. Do you know the amount of cysteine that are really free to uh, to react? So I have seen a citation, and this is something we're actively trying to sort of validate computationally of roughly 50% of cysteines are reduced, so not in disulfides, which to me is higher than what I would expect. Um, obviously, the, a substantial fraction of those are actually buried because cysteine thiol is side chain is pretty hydrophobic. So it's a nice residue for the sort of the internal packing of a protein can be advantageous. Um, so we don't know how many are solvent accessible. And that's, I'd say, a really interesting question. Um, but roughly speaking, that would be at least 25 to 30%. I'd say so, yeah. huh? out of 260,000. So that's pretty, still it's quite pretty a large high, number. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> still a, a lot to do. Thank you. And, and Shauna, do you want to ask your question about Derek Lowe's uh, podcast, well, blog? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Derek Lowe had a really interesting blog on uh, covalent fragment screening, particularly library screening. Um, and he asked at the end, if you could develop an optimized and potent covalent fragment, would it be possible to remove the warhead and actually still retain potency? So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that question. So this, this is what I think the entire idea behind Sunesis, which developed the uh, tethering approach uh, of installing a disulfide, finding a, a reversible yeah. binder and removing disulfide. And it didn't pan out really nicely for them, although they did have several challenging targets that they were able to progress at least chemical probes against, if not, if not uh, drug candidates. Um, we didn't have luck yet with this. What, what we do see is that uh, you can start with a, uh, a more reactive covalent fragment, build up the reversible recognition, and then do, tune down the reactivity. So you end up with a, a very, very selective and non-reactive covalent fragment. Um, but we haven't yet gotten to the point where you can just remove the covalency altogether. We've seen it with some covalent MEK inhibitors where we can co-crystallize those and even get potent binding in a non-covalent fashion with a more or less exact identical binding nodes, but well, it's you, probably you, promiscuous you, compounds. Co-crystal co doesn't necessarily mean it's potent. Do you have also- so, No, we have separate co yeah. 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 yeah, no, we see a lot of times we see uh, the reversible parts can co-crystallize with the protein in the same binding mode. 
but it just doesn't, doesn't translate into biochemical yeah. properties. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're five minutes over time, and I recognize that Carrie Ann needs to have some breakfast. <laughs> Wake up, probably. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I would like to thank all the speakers again for giving up their time and for sharing their ideas and thoughts with us. Um, and uh, yeah, I do hope, watch out for the next Target 35 uh, seminar. Um, Sean, I'm sure you mentioned the title, but um, could you remind me? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'd love to see everybody at our next seminar, which is on uh, chemoproteomic profiling from target discovery to target engagement. And that's going to be hosted by Jordan Muir at the National Cancer Institute in the USA. And I probably should thank Shona as well, because she deals with all the organization, all of the prep work and contacting everybody. So thanks, Shona. You're a massive help for getting this organized. Thanks. I have a lot of help behind the scenes as well. <laughs> well and your helpers, yeah. Okay, thank you everybody and um, have a good day. Cheers, bye. <laughs>